Our Bible study today is on Hebrews chapter 3, beginning of verse 7. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings in which uh, your word continues to proclaim Christ as uh, our Savior and as God and as man. We thank you, Lord, that, uh, that these words continue to speak to our hearts. We pray that you would bless our faith and our, um, and our study and especially bless your church in the world today to proclaim Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, we were reading through chapter 3 um, the last few weeks, and this is the section where the book of Hebrews is comparing Jesus to Moses. So in the first couple chapters, he compared him to angels, and like he, how, showing he was greater than the angels. And then now he's comparing him to Moses. And of course, you know, the name of the letter is uh, the epistle to the Hebrews. So these would be Jewish Christians. And in that first century, and this was probably written around 62, 65 at the latest, um, there was a temptation for the Jewish Christians to go back to their old traditions. Uh, and of course, the greatest pull was for, you know, lifting up Moses because for the Jewish people, Moses was like, you know, like a superhero. He was like the founder of the faith. I mean, of course, you know, Abraham was really the founder of, of the line, but Moses is the one who uh, went up to Mount Sinai. He conversed with God. He received the Ten Commandments. He was the intercessor between the people of Israel and God. So they really held him in high esteem. And so for Jesus to come along and, you know, the people who believed in him were, had come to faith that Jesus was the one that the Messiah who was spoken of in the Old Testament. But perhaps there was also this uh, belief like, well, we've been doing all these Jewish laws and following all the, the um, kosher laws for our whole lives. And now we believe in Jesus, but things are, um, you know, it, there was difficulty in the Roman Empire because the Jewish people were allowed to worship according to the Roman law, but the Christians were considered to be a new religion and were outlawed. So even though the, the Christians believed in, that they were Jews who had seen the fulfillment of their prophecies in Jesus Christ, uh, the, the Jews who didn't believe in Jesus really condemned it and said, oh, that's not our religion, that's a different religion. And the Romans said, oh, we're going to arrest all you Christians because you're illegal, right? Uh, and so there was a controversy. So then you have the Jewish Christians who were tempted to go back to Judaism, or at least maybe they'd say they believe in Jesus, but they wanted to go back to Judaism to maybe protect themselves, to keep themselves from being persecuted or arrested or killed or any of those things. So that may be in the background, but definitely there is, um, there is that temptation to maybe abandon what, they had come to believe. I like If you read in the beginning of the book of Revelation, it talks about the letters to the churches. And so Christ is in the Revelation is writing these letters to different types of churches, some of them who have lost their first love, right? And I can't remember which church that was. But um, just imagine, this is maybe the, the boat that the, uh, the Jewish Christians are in, and this letter is, is written to try to encourage them, don't give up your faith. And this, these, this is the ammunition you, you can have to show any other Jewish person who rejects Jesus why Jesus is truly the Messiah. Okay, so there's a lot of quotations in this letter from the Old Testament in order to support, you know, the understanding that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, so um, it had talked about how Jesus was, um, was faithful like Moses, um, and uh, how Jesus is greater than Moses because Moses was only, you know, dealing with like, um, he, he had built the house, but Jesus is the builder, right? So, you know, you, you can't have a, a, a wonderful, like, skyscraper unless it had been conceived in the mind of the, of the uh, architect, right? So Jesus is the one who, who um, is the architect or the builder or the creator and so he's got to be built greater than Moses, who was the one who was a builder, building the people of Israel up and, you know, bringing them out of Egypt and bringing them to the promised land. So that was the, um, the last argument that we saw in verses 1 through 6. So here in verse 7, um, it's, uh, it starts to talk about the warning against unbelief. So um, 
I'll start reading in verse 7. It says, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me and for 40 years saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation, and I said, Their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways, so I declared on oath in my anger they shall never enter my rest. Okay, well, first of all, this is a quote from Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11. And as it says, you know, that the person speaking in the, at verse 7 is the Holy Spirit, um, you know, but if we look at Psalm 95, I'm pretty sure it'll say, you know, thus says the Lord, you know, it's God speaking. So, you know, sometimes in the Old Testament, it'll mention the Spirit of God, right? And it uses the word Yahweh. So God, the Spirit of God is the same as God. It's just another way of describing God. So, of course, by the time the New Testament rolls around, we know that God is uh, revealed by Jesus as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that that's not necessarily a, a difficulty. I guess it might be interesting to to see why does uh, the author of the Hebrews say that the Holy Spirit is speaking here. Let's look at Psalm 95, though. So in Psalm 95, um, you know, this whole psalm, it starts out as like a worship psalm. So it starts out in verse 1 by saying, Come, let us sing for, for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. So it's the worship leader in the temple speaking to the people who were there to worship in the Old Testament time. And then if you, uh, as you go through verses 1 through 6, it's really the worship leader speaking to the people as they worship God, and it's spoken from the perspective of the person who's leading the worship, and they're inviting people to praise God. Let us bow down and worship to, to the Lord, our maker. So it's not talking about God speaking to God's people, but when you get to verse 7, it says, um, for he is our maker uh, he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the flock under his care. And then it shifts, and then, and then it, it moves into the first person. Today, if you hear his voice, so it's still talking about, you know, God, if you hear God's voice. Do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Manasseh in the desert, which is what happened in the book of Numbers when the people were uh, rebelling against Moses. Uh, you know, they... They were complaining, they didn't have enough food or water, and, they, and so definitely God was, uh, being, uh, God was testing them, but they were um, rebelling against him. And then, uh, and then it shifts in verse 9, where your fathers tested and tried me, so the word me is God speaking, though they had seen what I did. So the worship leader is all of a sudden... Uh, summarizing and quoting from what God said back in the book of Numbers. So he, he, he's not speaking for God, he's just speaking the words that God has already said, because you know, this is the summary of what happened in the book of Numbers. And so God is the one who is proclaiming uh, in verse 10, for 40 years I was angry with that generation. I said, the, they are a people whose hearts go astray, they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. <clears throat> why, why is God saying that? What is God angry about? Or they complained that they were too tight. Corn. That's right. They, they even said that they were better than Egypt. That's right. There we go. I mean, God had rescued them from Egypt, and, and they're saying, oh, it was so much better in Egypt. We had garlic and cucumbers yeah. and uh, yeah they, they mentioned all the stuff that they had but and so they complained it, just imagine they're saying to god we liked it better when we were slaves than we do now that you have freed us and god's pro providing for them they, he's giving them manna and quail and water and they're still complaining so uh, so god was patient with the people he you know gave them miracle after miracle and and they because they hardened their hearts against God, uh, God eventually was going to punish them. And so, you know, there's a difference between, you know, well, I guess it would say discipline, discipline and punishment. Discipline is uh, done with the um, intent of bringing a person to the truth, and uh, you do it out of love, right? Punishment might be more 
uh, a result of you know just uh, the law without mercy. You know, you've broken the law, you'll be punished. So God isn't necessarily punishing them as much as he is disciplining them. And yet, this is kind of like the breaking point. You know, God was patient with the people. So in verse 11, God says, in anger, I said, they shall never enter my rest. So what is the rest that he's talking about? Would it be heaven? Or? Well, they, they're no, getting, that's right, they're getting out of Egypt and they're supposed to go to the promised land and so it's at this point that God, when he right. says, they shall never enter my rest, he's talking about the promised land. Okay, but, but it does actually um, point ahead to a greater rest, and that's what the book of Hebrews is going to tell us. So the promised land is the place where they weren't going to enter. And so um, you know, the people who left Egypt, they were supposed to go to the promised land pretty quick, but then they ended up wandering for 40 years, not because they were lost, mm -hmm. but because God... He, he would not allow them to go into the promised land because of their faithlessness, right? And so it wasn't just this, but there was also the, the, um, the 12 spies that went into uh -huh. the promised land, and this is the very beginning of Numbers. They go into the promised land, and they come back, and they say, oh, 10 of them say there's giants in the land, and w there's no way we could ever o uh, overcome them. And so, uh, but then there's Joshua and Caleb who say, uh, yeah, but God is with us and he will deliver them into our hands and we will be victorious. And the people of Israel, they listened to the 10 spies who were afraid and because of that, God you know, really uh, says enough is enough. So his uh, rejection of them was a rejection of all of the Israelites over the age of 13 because everybody who was at the age of accountability and up were considered to be adults in the uh, in the community, and so all of those people were going to pass away before they got to the promised land. So in those 40 years, everybody 13 years old or older died before they got to the promised land. So only the children who left uh, Egypt made it to the promised land. And the ones born right. The way. Yeah, and those born along the way, right. And well, but in the only two adults over the age of 13 who made it to the promised land were Joshua and Caleb. Right? And even Moses didn't make it because Moses had uh, disobeyed God yeah. as well. Uh, you know, I mean, he, no one's perfect, but w he publicly defied God. God told him to touch the rock with a staff to bring water out, and he, he slammed, he hit the rock. Um, and God says, you know, because you uh, disobeyed me before the people of Israel, you shall not enter the promised land either. Uh, and, you know, we should never make our assumptions that you know, well, that's not fair, and, and oh, why would God do that to him? And oh, he made, he made it so far, and why, oh, you know. Uh, the problem is we, the context shows us that, you know, God had made a, a command, and there's, throughout the books of uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy, all the laws point to the fact that sin is deserving of death. And it's pr there's pretty uh, stern uh, consequences for disobeying God's law, right? I mean, even a, a child who, you know, disobeys their parents can be executed, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, there's all kinds of uh, capital punishment for sins that we might say in our world is like, oh, those are pretty, you know, minor. Why would God, somebody be killed for doing this? And, and the reason is because um, sin is like a cancer, and God wants to show how serious sin is, and if it doesn't get stopped and cut out uh, as soon as possible, then it will destroy the rest of the people. And, and really, all sin separates us from God. So to show the consequences of sin as being serious, it's because if it wasn't so serious, then there wouldn't be a need for an ultimate sacrifice, right? So Jesus' sacrifice on the cross would be meaningless if people could be good enough, right? But because sin deserves death, and all sins are condemnable, Jesus is needed, right? So the whole, whole Old Testament is preparing for Jesus. Uh, so God's declaration that they shall not enter the rest was not only that the people should not go into the promised land because they disobeyed, but it was also true for anybody who sins can't enter the promised land of heaven because of our sin. So the, the answer is that sin has to be taken away. So again, Preparing for the coming of Jesus. Uh, so if we go back to uh, Hebrews. Um, 
you know, the, the first part of that in verse uh, 7, you know, remind us that the Holy Spirit is the one who is, um, who is inviting us not to harden our hearts. Because the, the verse from Psalm 95 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. What, what voice of God would they hear? Well, in the Old Testament, you know, they, they said that the sound of God's voice was like thunder mm-hmm. as at, the, at Mount Sinai. And then in the New Testament, that's the same thing that people said when Jesus was baptized and God's voice said, this is my son whom I love. And it says some people thought that it had thundered, right? They, they, weren't, they didn't have the faith to hear what God was actually saying. And so because of their unfaithfulness, they, they, didn't, they were confused, right? So it's the gift of the Holy Spirit that gives us discernment, right? So discernment is the ability to understand spiritual things. Uh, the same thing is true in the New Testament when Paul talks about speaking of tongues. He says, you know, that some people have the gift of tongues, but others are also given the gift of discernment. They can interpret tongues. And so those two things have to go hand in hand. Um, but definitely, um, to hear God's voice is not just the audible way, but there's other ways. God speaks to us in several ways. You know, we, we know, like the very beginning of, cha- of Hebrews tells us, in the past, God spoke to us through the prophets which is the Old Testament. And today, he's spoken to us through his son. So already, we have the groundwork being laid for how do we know how God speaks to us. So if you hear God's voice through the writings of the Bible, through the words of Jesus Christ, that's what it's talking about. And it says, do not harden your hearts. So, and it compares how the people of the Old Testament rebelled and hardened their hearts against God. And it tells us about your fathers were tested. So God was testing the people of the Old Testament they wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and then Jesus comes along, and, and here you have a, an Israelite who is doing what the people of Israel in the wilderness couldn't do. For 40 years, they couldn't keep God's law. Jesus is in the wilderness as an Israelite for 40 days, and he obeys God even at the temptations of the devil. So in the whole 40 days in the desert with the devil being tempting Jesus was really to fulfill and to do what Israel couldn't do. He's Israel boiled down to one. Jesus is the representative. He's the only Israelite who ever fulfilled God's word. He's the only human who's ever fulfilled God's word. Uh, So um, this is a warning, but it's also a preparation for, for the Messiah. All of us are tested. All of us fall short. And, you know, the book of Romans tells us that, you know, everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one has done what is right, not one. And, and so that's just, a, those are quotes actually from the Old Testament as well. So Paul in Romans chapter 3, talking about how sinful we are, is really just using the Old Testament as the proof that we are um, sinners at heart. Uh, but still, the difference between a person who um, rejects God's word and a person who has heard God's word and then rejects it, that's, that's the thing that this passage I think is really talking about. Because... You can't say, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts to a person who doesn't know Jesus. If you don't even know Jesus, then how could you even hear his voice? So that's, well, that's why the Holy Spirit says in the book of Acts that no one, no one can say Jesus is Lord except through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us faith. But then when we have that faith, what do we do with it? Do we allow the world to tempt us into rejecting Jesus? Do we allow the problems of this life to get us down or to turn our back on Jesus? Do we, do we believe that Jesus isn't strong enough to help us in our, in our daily lives? That's the temptation. So I think that's you know, the, nap- the application for us. When we're told, don't harden your hearts, uh, that can happen to us. When you know, you're tempted to say, well, gosh, you know, my life is, you know, not doing well financially, you know, things are falling apart, and where's God? And if God really cared about me, if he really loved me, he would do, fix this. Or if my loved one is dying of cancer, if God really loved me, he would save this person. And, you know, I, I've heard of, you know, I know people who, who, who have lost their faith because they couldn't accept God's answer to their prayer. They prayed that God would fix something. But, you know, look at Job. You know, the thing is that Job didn't ask God to, like, he did ask God to take it away, but, you know, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't necessarily uh, blaming God. He, he did say that he didn't deserve it, um, 
but he didn't give up on faith, right? I mean, Job never said, you know, I stopped believing in you, God. Uh, and, and because God knew that, that's why he was able to withstand so much. So, you know, the Bible tells us in uh, the book of Isaiah that, that the Messiah will not, he will not break a, you know, he will not snuff out a, uh, what is it called? He will not snuff out a, um, a, candle? a candle or, well, like a, a smoking candle, right? So, like, if, it's, if the la- lamp is going out, he's not going to snuff us out. And if we're a, a bended reed, he's not going to break us. Mm-hmm. You know, he, Jesus is not interested in taking people who have weak faith and just breaking them and wiping them out. He, he doesn't do that. When our faith breaks, it's not because Jesus t- got rid of us and said, I'm through with you. It's because we gave up on Jesus, like giving into the temptation. So that's what this warning is. The people of Israel gave up on God. God punished them for their unbelief. And they didn't get to go into the rest. Uh, the rest was the promised land, but here he's going to also talk about there's a greater promised land. In verse 12, he says, See to it, my brothers, or sorry, see to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. So you see that he's using an Old Testament story to uh, make an application to the people, you know, to the Jewish Christians at the same time. Don't let, your, don't let sin and an unbelieving heart turn you away from the living God. Again, this is the same thing that we have to deal with. Uh, our world wants to take our faith away. It wants to destroy it. You know, and God is reminding us not to, um, not to give up, not to turn away from him. And so how do you do that? Well, uh, the author to the Hebrews is, is going to tell us not only is it that we put our trust in God, but there's, a, there's also a benefit from being part of the body of Christ. In verse 13, he says, but encourage one another daily, as long it is, as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Now, you, if you look in your Bibles, uh, most likely is the word today, is it capitalized? You know, of course, in the Greek, there's no, um, there's no, all the letters in the Greek are either all capital or all small. Yeah, so originally, the earliest manuscripts were all capital letters. And then they, they came a change in the second century where they started tr- uh, writing all in small letters. So if you have a manuscript that's all in capital letters, it's an older manuscript. It's probably from the first century and before. And small letters are sm- uh, from the s- uh, second century and, al- and, all and after. So, um, so in the Greek, there's no uh, capital for the word today. But, but most uh, Bibles would capitalize it because it is uh, talking about, uh, us, it's talking about the divine uh, opportunity that God gives to people to believe in Him. See, the invitation of the gospel is not going to be extended forever. So it's like saying like this. Um, uh, well, I have no problem with the Bible. I think it's wonderful, and Jesus sounds like a great guy. But if I become a Christian, I'm gonna have to change my life. Uh-huh. So maybe I'll do it tomorrow, right? So I'll become a Christian tomorrow. I'm I'm gonna eat, drink, and be merry, Mm -hmm. and then I'll become a Christian tomorrow because I I know that it it costs a lot for my lifestyle, and I don't want to put that much effort into it. So maybe you know, on my deathbed I'll convert or I'll be baptized or something. (laughs) And you know, I don't know if there's people who do that. Uh, I think that that's probably less likely because. um, uh, But I think that a person who believes that there's any merit in God's word or in the belief in God at all, and they turn it down because they love their sin more than they love Jesus, uh, is, is really saying no to the Holy Spirit, and they're, uh, and they're uh, really um, impairing their, um, their ability to be able to believe in the first place. Because once you turn down the gospel, the invitation may not come back too much often after that. It, it's like uh, Moses and the Pharaoh. Moses went to the Pharaoh the first five times and told him, let my people go, says the Lord. And he said no. So he hardened his own heart. Well, after the fifth time, he threw Moses out and says, I don't want to ever see you again. And, and then it tells us that God hardened his heart. In essence, the, the gospel, the opportunity to, to be saved, to receive blessings from God, to be under God's protection was withdrawn. Because he had hardened his heart, God hardened his heart. And so the invitation to become a believer, to be saved, uh, 
to be forgiven of our sins, is offered. But the more times we say no, then eventually it comes a point where God's going to withdraw it. And that's why I would say that um, people who, well, I mean, statistics bear this out, that the number of people becoming Christians declines with each decade. So, like, if you're not a believer in your 20s, you probably, you, you know, the chance of becoming a believer in your teens is probably the highest. It's, you know, I, I'm not sure what, I remember reading the statistics of people who become Christians when they're in their teens is in the 60s, 60 percentile and up. And then in, when you're in your 30s, it drops down, you know, 40, 35, 40 percent. In your 60s, it drops down into the low 30s. In your 70s, it drops, I think it's down to 18 percent. So, the older you get, the less chance you, there is of a person becoming a believer in Jesus Christ. It's because you've hardened your heart, and the, you know it's going to be very difficult to change. I mean, we all know that as you get older, you don't change. No yeah, way. you can set in your ways, yeah. right? Well, the same thing is true with your, with your beliefs, right? If I don't believe in God, why am I going to start believing right. him now? Mm -hmm. So God is warning us that if you hear the gospel when it is when that invitation comes today, receive it gladly. Don't reject it because, uh, you know, the hardness of your heart will, um, will deceive you and then you'll eventually not be able to hear it anymore. I mean, it'll be like your ears are closed to the gospel. And, and so this is an eternal consequence. This is something that is a warning. Uh, so, you know, this is something I think, especially in Baptist churches, you know, they, they call people, if you don't believe in Jesus, this is your chance right now. Now, of course, if you have unbelievers in the worship service, that is definitely the Holy Spirit talking to their hearts. Uh -huh. This is it. Uh -huh. Don't turn away from it. You know, I mean, a lot of times, um, I think that in a lot of churches, there's probably not a lot of people who are unbelievers in the church. I think there's a difference between evangelistic preaching mm -hmm. and then, you know, preaching for encouragement in the faith, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, but I never assume that there's, Ne I don't assume that there's nobody uh, who's a believer, uh, nobody who's an unbeliever in the service. I, I always try to um, preach in a way. Sometimes I'm in a circumstance where I know that there's unbelievers, and then I do get more, um, I, I focus more on this passage, this idea that this is the chance, don't give up on the gospel, hear it for what it's worth, and that usually happens in, uh, in funerals. So like in a, in a funeral, there's a lot of friends who've come right. to, the, to the funeral for the person, but they, they don't necessarily go to church, they don't believe in God. And so I use that as an opportunity to share the gospel and say this is, this is the chance for you to receive what God is giving you, the forgiveness of your sins. Don't say no to Jesus. Okay, sometimes I, I do that a little bit in uh, weddings too, but in weddings people are less likely to listen to you because they're all thinking about the bride and the groom and uh. stuff like that. <laughs> But funerals are actually pretty, uh, pretty good about this. Uh, you know, but here the author of the Hebrews is just writing to these uh, Jewish Christians um, and the temptation that may come along for them to allow sin's deceitfulness to lead them astray. And isn't that what s uh, sin is always like? It's always trying to deceive us into thinking. You know, whether it's the devil or it's the world or it's our own sinful flesh, it doesn't matter. Those are the three places from which sin and the temptation to abandon our faith come from, right? Sometimes it's the devil, but sometimes it's the world, and sometimes it's just us, right? We have a sinfulness in our hearts that is prideful and selfish, and that'll keep us from Christ just as well as the devil will, so we can't blame everything, everything on him. Um, and verse 14 says, We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we have had at first. So notice that it's saying that, that we'll share, uh, that we have come to share. So it's something that, that these believers and us already have. We share in Christ. You know, his victory on the cross, his forgiveness of sins through his sacrifice is something we already have. But then he says, if we hold firmly. So just because you have something doesn't mean that you'll always have it until you have it to the end, right? So we're talking about the, the race of faith. Paul describes, you know, faith as a race. And you got to cross the finish line, which is getting into heaven. Uh, and if you don't cross that finish line in faith, then you know you've missed out, right? So, um, so that's why we have to persevere. There are you know some churches, some Christian denominations that teach once saved, always saved. Uh, 
which um, I don't think is biblical because, you know, specifically it's talking about, uh, it's here, it says, we have come to share in, in Christ. So it's talking about Christians who believe in Jesus. How can you share in Christ if you're not a believer, right? You have to have faith in order to share in the blessings of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins. But then he says, if we hold firmly to the end. So the word if there is conditional. It means that there's a possibility that you can lose what you have. And so he's encouraging them to not give up, to have the confidence that we had at first. So, you know, you came to faith, the Holy Spirit, you know, comes in new believers are just filled with joy and excitement. But it's the Christian faith is, is a marathon, not a sprint, right? I mean, you can, look, you can look like a very powerfully faithful and excited Christian the beginning of your walk, but if you peter out and you don't finish the race, then it's no good, right? I mean, it doesn't matter how fast you run, it's how long. It's the, that marathon thing. Uh, and so this is, again, an encouragement to not give up because for these early Christians, they were starting to be persecuted by the Romans, and eventually there was going to be, you know, the temple was going to be destroyed, and a lot of pressure and persecution was going to come upon them. And a lot of them would abandon their faith. So this letter was written to try to, to help as many of those Jewish Christians as possible to not leave the faith, as well as, you know, for us today. As, as Christians today, we still need that same encouragement. In verse 15, he quotes again um, from Psalm 95, uh, two verses from this that he copied or that he already quoted. Today, if you, it says, as, as has just been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Uh, so he, he quotes it again just to remind them that, um, you know, that those Israelites were followers of God, but then they hardened their hearts against them. And so hearing God's voice is always an opportunity to be taken hold of immediately. Verse 16, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? So he's, he's not talking about just like specifically evil people. It's not like, you know, oh, there was a couple of rabble rousers in the people of Israel as they left Egypt and God was gonna just destroy those really bad people. Everybody else was just okay. No, he's saying, <laughs> Were they not all those who Moses led? All, 100% of the people that left Egypt rebelled against Moses and said, God, let us out here to die. You know, it was better to be slaves in Egypt. We had better food back there. You know, so uh, it just goes to show that, um, that that's right. No, we're all, none of us are immune to falling prey to the sin of pride and rebellion. So we have to just... You know, we, our prayer should be, Lord, you know, I'm going to just get through this on my own. No, our prayer should be, Lord, I know that I'm just as susceptible as anyone else. Help me to be faithful. Send me your Holy Spirit. Help me to hear your voice today and respond in faith and love and thankfulness. Okay, and then he goes on in verse 17. And with whom was he angry for 40 years? You know, uh, when, in Greek, whenever you ask a question, the answer is already implied in the question, right? Mm -hmm. so, so there's two ways that you can ask a question like, um, and whom was he angry with for, for those 40 years? You could say, well, you, I guess usually the question would be like, um, uh, were, they, were they not, uh, was he not angry with him for 40 years? And the answer would be implied yes, or uh, certainly he was not angry with him for 40 years, and the answer would be implied no. So this one obviously is, is implied, you know, yes, God was angry with him. Um, and it goes on to say, was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? So, you know, throughout the book of, uh, of Numbers, God was um, punishing the people who were rebelling against him. So this is an argument based on uh, the stories that we read. Uh, as they were trying to get to Canaan, um, a lot of this is in Numbers chapter 14, the whole generation of Israelites uh, fell um, in the desert because of God's punishment for their sin and rebellion. Uh, so, you know, what is his point here? Well, he's trying to, to warn us that if God's own people, the Israelites, would be punished for their sin, the same thing would be true for us. So, 
how do we avoid the punishment of our sin? Well, as believers in Christ, these Hebrew Jews, uh, these Hebrew Christians already knew the answer was through their faith in Jesus. But now they're being tempted to give up that faith. So he's telling them, don't give up faith. Jesus is your only chance for salvation. Verse 18, he continues with the argument. He says, and to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest? If not to those who disobeyed. And, uh, and the word here for disobeyed can also be translated as disbelieved. So, um, you know, disobedience and unfaithfulness go hand in hand, right? So they're, they're really two sides of the same coin. You know, it, when you disobey, a, a person could say, oh, I'm a Christian, but then they, you know, maybe they take money from their work. They, uh, you know, maybe they're living a, a, a promiscuous lifestyle. They, uh, they, you know, they're partying in a way that gives, uh, that gives in to um, the things that God condemns in Scripture. He talks about, you know, um, promiscuity and, and sexual immorality and drunkenness. And all those things are part of disobedience and rebellion. And a person who claims to be a Christian and yet does those things, are, they're fooling themselves. Right? You're fooling yourself if you think that you can live in sin and that it's not going to affect you. Uh, so that ends up really being disbelief. And then he concludes this section in verse 19. He says, so we, see, so we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. You know, so he's really hitting hard on this whole idea about unbelief. Um, the Israelites were punished for their unbelief, and the same thing will come to us. And so these Jewish Christians were tempted to stop living their life as if Jesus' death and resurrection made any difference. You know, it's not that they were going to completely say, well, we don't believe in Jesus. But if you go back to your lifestyle and say, well, I, in order for me to be acceptable to God, I have to follow all the laws, right? I got to, you know, during the Passover, I get rid of all the yeast in my house. I'm, you know, do you, I don't know if you know anything about, like, some of the uh, Orthodox Jewish customs today. They, they, they won't have any milk and meat products at the same time. Because there's a passage in the book of Leviticus that says, do not boil a kid in its mother's milk. So it's talking about like a goat, like a baby goat. Don't boil a goat in its mother's milk. And because of that, they believe meat and milk products shouldn't be used together. So uh, Jewish people, Orthodox Jewish people, will have milk products like cheese and milk and eggs and stuff. They'll have that at breakfast. But at dinner, they'll only have meat products. So you know, there's no cream for your coffee. There's no cheese. There's not, nothing. They, no meat products. And if you're real, you know, you got to be really strict. So not only do you not have milk and meat products on the same meal, you don't want to mix in your stomach, but you also don't want to mix on your plate or on your dishes. So they actually have two sets of dishes. You have a, a set of dishes and a, two separate dishwashers, too. For Orthodox <laughs> Jewish people usually will have two dishwashers. They'll have a dishwasher for the, meat, for the milk product dishes and the meat product dishes. So if you serve, like, ro pot roast, you got to wash that in the, in the specific... Um, dishwasher for that and then if you have cheese on your bagels and in the morning you have to wash that dish on a, a different dishwasher <laughs> well I I don't know I don't actually know if they uh, go that far as long as it's in the same in a separate package and they're not touching each other it's all right because what happens in the dishwasher all the particles touch each other <laughs> that's right so I uh, so I, I do know of Jewish homes that do have two dishwashers, but I've never heard of two, two refrigerators. Yeah. And, yeah. I take it back and two sets of dishes, Jewish. right? And, and this isn't necessarily something that's found in the ancient uh, culture. This is something that's, that uh, started um, after the time of Jesus, right? So the, the, um, the rabbis continued to interpret the Old Testament in a way that was becoming more man's law than God's law. And they were taking man's laws and putting it above God's laws. I mean, like for instance, the Sabbath day, it tells us to rest. Well, then, you know, the, the uh, rabbis were saying, well, you shouldn't do any work. And then Jesus said, would quote from the book of Deuteronomy and says, if, a, if your neighbor's donkey falls into a ditch on the Sabbath day, doesn't God's word say that you should help him? So you're supposed to work on the Sabbath to do good. Mm -hmm. And so when Jesus was healing people, he was actually doing the same thing. You know, it doesn't specifically say in the Old Testament, thou shalt not practice medicine on the Sabbath. But Jesus was fulfilling the law by saying, any time you do good to anybody, 
on the Sabbath, that is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. Because resting is resting in God's provisions and his love. So worshiping God is a type of rest. Helping people is a type of rest. But if you're going to be selfish and use the laws to try to get around what God's will is, then you're actually being pharisaical, uh -huh. you know, hypocritical. And so Jesus called them out on their hypoc hypocrisy. So, uh, so he, he, anyways, he finishes this section here, just uh, warning them about their possible unbelief. Not that he, you know, this letter was not written specifically to a group of people who were already in, you know, in, uh, in apostasy, but because that, that was where the temptation was. And, and it's definitely good for us today because we also um, may be tempted to, to give up. You know, obviously different circumstances for different Christians. I mean, in China, Christians are persecuted so much that it is, uh, you know, anybody be being a Christian is kind of crazy. It's like you're inviting problems in your life. But, peop you know, because then the government's always looking at you, they're trying to find you, to arrest you, and people who, who are active Christians will be tortured, and many of them have been killed. You know, that doesn't happen in America. So in America, the temptation is more like, you know, the frog in the, in the warm pot of water. You just turn up the, the heat a little bit at a time, and eventually we'll be boiled to death. So the temptations are, are easygoing and subtle. laid back, and they're subtle and small, but over time, you know, we buy into the culture. We, we say, well, gosh, everybody's doing everybody's it. Smart. That's right. Well, if everybody else, well, since when is, is truth a dem is based on democ democracy? Since when is it the uh, decision of the majority of the people that makes something true? You know, it, if something is uh, wrong and people think it's okay, that doesn't make it okay. And so we have to, um, we, and as Peter and John said, when the Sanhedrin said, stop speaking about Jesus, they said, we must obey God rather than man. So for Christians, that's our higher calling. We call, we believe in God, and we must obey him rather than humans. So we obey the government in so far as it is in accordance with God's will. So the Bible says do not kill, and the, and the law says it's against the law to, to murder people, right? And if you murder somebody, you'll go to jail. The God's word also says that, you know, God created a man and a woman and that the two became one flesh and that that was the first marriage and it, and it, and it has other passages that uh, reject same-sex marriage. So whether or not people want to live like that, you know, God's word condemns that and Christians can't accept that. It doesn't mean that we can be prejudiced. It just means that we have to stand up for what's right. And that definitely is something that our society is uh, dealing with and and as Christians, we, we have to say that uh, I have to obey God rather than man. You know, and so we're talking about our own personal choices, right? If other people make choices, they are accountable for those uh, choices. Uh -huh. but, but the thing I think is interesting is that some Christians would say, um, well, I'm not sure if I know if it's right or wrong. I'm just going to support it because I think it's okay. You know, but, but God wor God's word says that that's not what God intends, right? So... For a, person, for a Christian to support uh, same-sex marriage, I think goes against God's word. Uh, but a person who's an unbeliever who's living in that lifestyle, you know, they're outside of God's right. will yeah. and they're outside of the church. So we, it's not that we're judging them. God's word judges them. They'll stand before their maker someday. Mm -hmm. We don't need to like condemn everybody who does something wrong because in essence, we're sinners too. We're all condemned unless we have faith in Jesus. So instead of like telling people you're doing something wrong, the Christian is called to, to, to invite people to believe in Jesus and to know who Jesus is. Because when you read the Bible and you know that Jesus died for your sin, then the Holy Spirit is the one who reminds us of our sin, which reminds us of our need for Jesus. Mm -hmm. right? So unless you, unless you know that you're a sinner, you don't see any need for Jesus. And so the word of God will do that. We don't, you know, Christians don't need to beat people over the head. But uh, for the believer, it is important. You know, that's why the church is important because um, we need to be reminded of what's wrong so that we'll go to Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins and then we hear the gospel, which is the sweet news of our, uh, of our redemption, that, uh, that we're free, free from sin, right? And that freedom from sin is available to anyone who will believe. But again, you know, Jesus said, don't throw pearl before swine, 
because a, a person who doesn't think that they're a sinner doesn't see their need for uh-huh. forgiveness of very sin. True, true. Right? So if you tell a person, you know, oh, Jesus loves you, but they don't believe in Jesus, what good is that? Yeah. Or Jesus died for your sins, and they say, well, that might be good for you, but I haven't done anything wrong. Uh-huh. You know, like talking to a wall. Yeah. So, again, th- this book was written for believers, so it's not you know, necessarily condemning people who are already outside of the church. It's condemning people who believe in Jesus but are tempted to give up on him. Okay. Um, well, I'll just do a few verses in chapter 4 then. It says, Therefore, since the promise of, etern- of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Now, originally in the, in the Bible, the chapters, chapters and verses were not there. You know, the original manuscripts didn't have any verses or chapters. These were added in the early Middle Ages at, um, by uh, scholar monks in order to, um, to, to be able to read them uh, and know where you left off and to be able to, for other people to say, uh, you know, oh, this passage is good. Because if you didn't know where that passage was, you, you know. So it was, it was a system that was introduced by the Christian church in order to um, be able to find things. Uh, so it's not that chapter 4 is a brand new uh, topic. It's actually just the continuation of what it was just talking about. Because so, the word therefore is talking about what came before it. So these people who, uh, because of their unbelief in the book of Numbers, were not able to go to the promised land. He's saying that, the, that this promise of entering God's rest still stands. So he's taking the idea of what the Old Testament people were doing. They're going to the promised land to rest. He's saying there's still that promise. God is still inviting us to enter his rest. So this is um, what you were saying before. It's, it's actually uh, pointing us to heaven. So here is where the author of the Hebrews is reminding us that there is a greater rest. Let us be careful that none of you be found, be found to have fallen short of it. Uh, so... Um, the encouragement for vigilance and for um, perseverance in our faith. In verse 2, for we also have had the gospel preached to us, just as they did. So did the Old Testament people have the gospel preached to them? Of course. The gospel was, you know, put your faith in Jesus, and, or in God. Put your faith in God, and he will care for you. God says, I'm a holy God, and you must be a holy people. He says, I'll be your God, and you'll be my people. So it was not only a command, it was also a promise. When God says that, he promises what he, what he demands. He, he tells us that we have to have faith in order for us to be saved. So faith is something he gives to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. So he not only requires faith, but he gives what he requires. Mm-hmm. And so that's what, you know, here in verse 2, uh, we had the gospel. They had the gospel preached to them just as, as we do. And he goes on to say, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. So that, that was um, the problem of the people of the Old Testament, uh, especially in the wilderness. Now, it's interesting here that to say that they did not have faith is almost, uh, almost more than we can imagine. Is it true that all the, none of the Israelites had faith? And so the thing is that there are some other manuscripts other Hebrew, man, other manuscripts of this chapter here actually have another verse. Uh, the manuscript, instead of saying, um, because those who heard it did not combine it with faith, there are some manuscripts that say, because they did not share in the faith of those who obeyed. So it's a slightly different meaning. Um, and I think that it's trying to uh, smooth out the, uh, that misunderstanding that could come by thinking that, how is it possible that all these that none of these Israelites had faith? Here it's talking about the possibility that maybe those other Israelites um, that they did not share in the faith of those who who obeyed. So that it's that argument from the book of James that uh, if you say you have faith without works, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. Faith without works is dead, is what James writes. And so it's the idea that real faith is going to be seen in your actions. So you had these Israelites in the desert, and to say that they, were, that they had no faith at all was maybe going too far. So there may have been uh, another manuscript. So which one was the original writing? We, we don't know. Usually um, 
when you have a translator, they have to choose between hundreds of manuscripts. And the note here is just telling us that there are some manuscripts that have this other thing. So um, it might have been like scratched out and written above, but usually if you see there's a line in the manuscript, that is obviously a change. So those, don't, those changes don't make it into a translation because they just igno ignore those. So, but the fact is that there had been somewhere down the line a copy of the book of Hebrews that had a slight change in it that and it wasn't just a cross out, it was just a different sentence. And that's why they put it in the footnote. But the majority of the manuscripts, the oldest ones, have this, what we were reading in here, which said, because those who had heard did not combine it with faith. Um, and again, he's just giving us the warning that if you say you believe in God, but you don't actually live your, your faith out in your actions, then you're kind of fooling yourself. It's like deceiving yourself. It's kind of like, a, you know, have you heard the story about uh, there was a group of fishermen. They loved fishing. They went out all the time, and they would catch uh, all kinds of fish on, on uh, Saturday mornings. And then, and then the club started growing, and it started getting harder to uh, drag the boats out. And, and so they decided, you know, oh, we'll go fishing once a month, and we'll, but we'll talk about how we're going to get ready for our fishing trips, uh, you know, for the other three Saturdays of the month. And eventually the group got larger and larger until it just became a club about fishing and nobody in the club ever did go fishing. So is it a fishing club or not? You know, it's, it's, this is the idea, is that the, the more your faith gets divorced from the life of a Christian disciple, the less you really are a follower of Jesus. Uh, and, uh, and, and this isn't just like a a type of law saying, you know, you better shape up because the answer isn't found in us because by our own works, we are dead and our, our good deeds are like filthy rags before the Lord, it says in the book of Jeremiah. Um, so he goes on in verse three, now we who have, who have believed enter that rest just as God has said. So I declared on, on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. So he's saying that, that if we believed, we enter the rest but those who disbelieved, God said he would not let them enter the rest. So that's really the, the separating of the sheep and the goats, right? Uh, Jesus talked about in Matthew 25 that the sheep and the goats will be separated. Those who do not believe, God proclaims they shall never enter my rest. Those are the goats. Those who do have faith have heard the invitation, have ex received it, accepted it, and they are the sheep, and they are the ones on the right hand who do enter into eternal life. The rest of uh, verse 3, after the quote, says, And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. You know, it's talking about how God, uh, you know, that he had finished creating. Um, his work was, you know, when, Jesus, when God rested on the seventh day, did, he, did, that means that, did that mean that God completely rested, that he stopped doing anything? No, the only thing he rested from is the act of creating more things. He, didn't, he stopped creating more things, but he didn't stop working. And, and Jesus actually said this as well. Jesus said, my father has not stopped working uh, up until this time. And he says, neither will I stop working, right? Because Jesus was talking about the fact that the whole world is being upheld by God because he continues to sustain the world and to provide for the world, right? So Jesus is saying that's why he was healing people because his job was to continue working like his heavenly father was working. Okay, so again, that's what this point is here. Um, and then he goes on to, in verse four. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, and on the seventh day God rested from all his work. So that's a quote from Genesis two, verse two. At, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't say specifically where it's at because the, the people he's speaking to, they knew where this verse came from. And then verse 5, he says, and again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. So he's trying to make an argument about how uh, God prepared a rest for his people, but God himself never stopped working. Mm -hmm. And the whole point was that, yeah, the people were going to be sinners, that they were going to fall into sin, that they would deserve death, but God had a plan to get them out of this sin and death by sending his sa uh, Savior, his son, Jesus Christ. Okay, well, it, um, We'll stop here, and uh, next week we'll start at verse 6.